So thank you very much for great worship. You know, every time we sing, I'm thinking like about the meaning of the words. Not just the tune, although it's beautiful, but the meaning of the words. What a friend we have in Jesus. You know, people are social. People need friendship. That's why the Facebook and all the social network is so popular. They crave for friendship. And you know what people like? People like the like when they get the like. How many likes, you know? That's, but that's not the true friendship. You know, what a friend we have in Jesus. He is a true friend at all times. This is beautiful when we start our day with these thoughts, you know. And then open the eyes of my heart. Like, God, I want to see you, really. Because there are people who have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears and they don't hear. But we want to be humble and say, God, open the eyes of my heart. I want to hear from you today. I want to be enriched with your presence. So let's pray before we start. So dear God, thank you for this great morning. We really want to know that you are our friend we want to learn of you and, and we want to see you. Just open our ears, our hearts that we can receive. Just speak to us through your scripture. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So before we open the scripture, I want to welcome you. So, dobro uh, došli. And the only Romanian word I know is merci. I don't know how to say like welcome, so merci. Uh, how do you say welcome in Romanian? Yeah, that's too difficult for me. Yeah. And, and how do you say uh, bon voyage? Like. Drum bun. Yeah, I know this. Yeah. Yeah. We were buying something on the street and the lady said drum bun. Sounded nice, drum bun. So that's easy to remember. So from now on, drum boom, you know, with, with God, we will, have a, we will have a bon voyage, nice road, drum boom. Well, I'm, I'm learning oh, Romanian. Uh, welcome, dobrodošli, uh, we say vitejte, vitejte. It's, it's the same root, like in Russian, privet, vitate, vitejte. Yeah, or, or in Serbian, dobro došli, it means really, well, come. You know, you came and you are, we are happy that you came. Welcome. So, welcome everybody. And uh, let's turn into the Bible. In the second epistle of John. Now, if you need a Bible, we have some Bibles over there, so just grab one. Uh, many people have on their phones, you know, new technology. The phone has, has a very one good feature, you know. When you have a, a Bible on the phone, you can just zoom in and do the letters big, so you see good. So you don't need a giant print Bible. Okay, so we are here, and we are starting. So the second epistle of John. We will spend a few Sundays on this second epistle of John before we went through the first epistle of John verse by verse. And we learned so much about the character of God, about the body of Christ, about the church, about the life of the believers in the church. And now uh, I want to just go through the second epistle of John. And this epistle is very short. It has only 13 verses. It's very short. It's uh, easy to understand this book because it's not a, a large volume of the thoughts. But although it's small, it's like very rich. So, second epistle of John. Now, uh, to understand the situation, uh, basically, uh, 
This book has been written approximately, nobody knows exact date, but they say 85 to 90 uh, AD. So uh, 90 years after the crucifixion of Christ. Which means that this book has been written and we see it uh, by the Apostle John, who was the first hand witness, eyewitness. And the book was written basically 30 years plus minus after the crucifixion. It puts it into these books which bring like very fresh witness. <clears throat> if somebody would like to uh, know something uh, about your grandmother or grandfather, where would you go and where would you ask? Well, if somebody wants to know something about my grandmother, mother he should ask my grandfather because they knew each other they lived together and he is the first hand or eyewitness uh, that's why uh, these testimonies are so valid because it's a first hand witness these people lived with jesus walked with jesus they experienced jesus doing things uh, Hardly you would believe a testimony of someone who would be writing about your grandmother 600 years later. You know, what can anybody say about your grandmother when he will be writing his letters 600 years later? And I'm just, I'm just hitting the point and I'm like aiming at the, uh, at the Islamic faith and uh, Muhammad. You know, we got the Quran which brings some ideas or testimony about the life of Jesus, but this testimony is so distant from the original source. And this is just for people, you know, to start to think. Because in Serbia we are meeting a lot of uh, Christians, but also a lot of people from uh, Islamic background. And uh, this is something to consider, you know, just the, just the power of the witness. It's same like when you are in the court and you have witnesses. And somebody says, and he says, well, I've seen it with my eyes how it happened. So his testimony is valid. Or somebody can come and he will say, well, I lived 600 years later, but I will tell you how it was. You know, it, it loses its point. You know, there is no validity in this. So I'm just, I'm just hitting this to, to provoke some listeners and, and make them think. But now, uh, the second epistle of John, and it starts here. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. Verse 2. For the truth's sake, which dwells in us, and shall be with us forever. Now notice this, this is very interesting. We've read just two very short verses. And there is one word which has been repeated five times in two verses. He's speaking about the truth. He says, whom I love in truth. And then for the truth's sake. And then not I only, but also those that have known the truth. So you see uh, that the truth which dwells in us and shall be with us forever. It looks like that the truth is a very important topic. If you would be writing a letter and you would start with the word truth and in the beginning you would repeat it five times. Maybe you are putting like big emphasis on the word truth. And I like it because it deals with many things. First, it deals with so-called agnosticism. Many people believe in agnosticism. It means a is a denial, a negative, and gnosis is knowing, knowledge. And many people say, well, you cannot know God. It's impossible. It's this approach like, well, we cannot know. We don't know what's the truth. We don't know who God is, you know. And they come to this conclusion like there are many different ways to God. Maybe you've heard this uh, comparison. What's the difference between Christianity, Islam, Buddhism and other beliefs? 
Well, one is, they are all holding the same elephant. One is grabbing him by, 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 the, uh, by the leg, one by the tail, and one by the trunk. trunk. That's why everybody describes him different way, but they all speak about the same. Maybe you've heard this comparison, right? We've heard this. But we see here that this is not the point. It's not like we cannot truly know God and everyone has his own piece of truth. No. Uh, the Apostle John says very strictly here, and he says, there is a truth, absolute truth. Uh, this also deals with so-called relativism. You know, many people will tell you, well, there is no absolute truth. It's a matter of point of view, you know. And they will tell you these examples, like you have a cup which is filled into half. Well, is it half full or half empty? You know, it's a matter of a viewpoint. Either you are optimistic or pessimistic. And they have all these different ideas or a view of angle, you know. But the Bible teaches us that there is one very important truth. No matter how we look at it, there is a truth. Because it's not my truth and thinking I know the best and I know what's the best for me, but I truly believe in God. This is Christianity, trusting God. You know, I'm, I'm meeting so many Christians everywhere, not just in Serbia. And they say, well, I'm a Christian and I know what's the best for me. And we spoke about it yesterday during this mission trip a little bit. Uh, when Abraham and Lot separate themselves, you know, Lot saw with his eyes, he lifted up his eyes and he made a choice. And he thought, the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah are good for me. And we know it is led into disaster. But in Abraham's case, God said, now lift up your eyes because I will show you what is the truth. And Abraham believed. Are we looking for solution that we think is the best in our life? Is it my truth, my choice, my solution, my idea? I know what's the best. Or are we really open to God and say, God, I want to hear your voice. I want to know the truth. Not just my truth, but your truth. The, you know, God sees behind the corner. Do we understand this? You know, we see the street, but God sees behind the corner. He knows what's waiting there. We don't know what to expect. That's why it's good to trust God, because he knows the best and he loves us very, very much. In John chapter 18, there is a discussion between Jesus and the Pilate. We read it here. John 18, verse 38. Pilate is questioning Jesus. And he asks him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answers him. And he says, I bear witness unto the truth. And basically he says, Yes, I am. And Pilate responds, John 18, verse 38. And Pilate said unto him, what is truth? What is truth? Who can know? And this is, this is one of the first mentions. Of course, there are other writers, but this is a very, very uh, well-known sentence of this relativism. What is truth? I mean, Jesus, you say this is truth. I'm Pilate, and I say, what is truth? You know? This paper, this sheet of paper. Is it white? Sure, it's white paper. Well, you know, it's a little bit grayish. Because the white is not the white. And the black is not black. And you know, and people are going this way. Like, they would, they would question, like, anything and everything. Just to keep this, like, what is truth? And this is the problem. Because if we... If we leave foundation, in a Psalm 11, verse 3, it says, If foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? 
And it's a very interesting thought. Because if we do not hold on to these foundations, then truly Pilate's question is true. What is true? Let's look at the question of, for example, marriage. Or we could go even before the... Yeah, marriage. When the people could marry, what are the rules? And you know, Bible defines the marriage is defined by the man and the woman. They come into union out of a free will decision under the umbrella of love. That's the marriage when they enter into this. And these two shall become one. There's an intimacy. And what's the purpose? Ephesians 2, 25. Husbands, love your wives as a Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So the purpose of entering the marriage is, I am laying down my life because by this I redeemed the marriage and, and I glorified. Now, if I don't have this truth, okay, what are the conditions for entering the marriage? Well, somebody will say, well, it's good for society if two men enter marriage, two women. You know, today you have people who are marrying trees. There is a, someone who married a horse recently. Can you believe this? Now it's allowed. You can marry a horse. It's sick. But you know, why is it sick? Let's, let's forget about the Bible. Let's say there is no foundation. Well, in Rome, people used to do it. When you look back into the old Egyptian religions, people were marrying crocodiles. They were marrying animals because by this they were worshipping gods, demons of those days. And somebody will come with idea and he will say, okay, these ancient Civilizations which were greater than we are were doing it. Why not we? Look at the wicked Rome in those days when Apostle John has written this letter. People were worshipping this uh, uh, the goddess of, of Aphrodita, you know, goddess of fertility. And they were like doing different kinds of things. In those days, you know what was prevalent? Young boys, I don't know the age exactly, but maybe 8, 10, they were given for education to old men. You know what this education means, education? These young boys were given to the old man, and the old man was teaching them the beauty of love. Can you believe this? It was the school system of those days. It's shocking. But you know what? It's coming. Look at the school system today. It's becoming more and more perverted. But who can stop it? If the Bible is not the foundation, then what's true? Why do you say it's wrong? It worked during the Roman Empire. Maybe it could work even nowadays. You know, there, if, if we throw the Bible out of the window, you can do anything and you will justify it and you can see it there's a political party i believe in in Nieder netherland holland and they are aiming for legalizing the pedophilia it's a legal party they are called like a uh, pedophilia party and they have this uh they have this program and they say we suffer because we love little boys and we want them. So they are doing everything to make it legal. Does it sound sick for you and for me? Well, well, if, if there is no boundaries of the scripture, if there is no definition, and you know, I go into extreme now, why is it sick? Who says what's right and what's wrong? What's, what's the age for sex? 15, they want to lower it in Europe into 14 or 13 because they say that this generation is more mature. Well, what they want to do, they want to get kids getting involved into sexual activity very early. 
because there's, there's this pedophilia agenda behind. You know, it's interesting. Why should be the age 15? And by the way, the age for the sexual activity is a marriage. That's the age limit. Because the sex belongs into marriage as a love expression of this union. If people are not married, there is no union. Because they have not united. The man never said to this woman, I take you as my wife. They are still strangers. And this is how the world lives today. What is true? You know, people say today, why should we marry? It's just a paper, piece of paper. You know, okay. Why should you do the driving license? It's a piece of paper anyway. Right? No. You know, God knows what's the best. There are certain rules. And this is very interesting. Because, because uh, people, people has done away with the Bible from the schools. You remember how it used to be in the school system? Uh, I believe in Serbia there is a religion in a, in, a, in a classroom, but it's like free class. You can like volunteer for it. It's not mandatory. Uh, another question is, how is it being presented? You know, I don't really know. I believe there may be great teachers, uh, but most of the time, usually, uh, just the knowledge and law is presented. Uh, many times, the lamp of God, the Christ life is missing there. And we should be careful about this. So when people are done away with the Bible from the school system, what can we expect? You know, what can we expect? You know what happened recently in Czech? It's the EU, European Union. I'm just saying this because it's everywhere. There was this class of the children. Uh, and they went and there was this program for them. They went to one room and in this room there was a fireman. So they sit uh, around the table with this fireman and he was showing them like his uh, you know, tools and he was telling stories how he's saving lives of people and everything. Then they went into another room. There was a policeman, you know, with the guns and dogs. And he was teaching them how the policeman lives. In another room, there were some doctors. So they were like showing the kids how the doctors live. And then there was this other room. And there was a gay couple. And he was teaching children how they live. Can you believe it? And there's the point. When we don't have the Bible as a foundation, anything is allowed. And everybody will justify his actions. Because what's true? Why is it wrong? If the scripture is not in the view, then Pilate's question is there. What is truth? And you know how it leads? Uh, in this story, John 18, 38. Then he said this and went out again to the Jews and said unto them, I find in him no fault. There's no fault in Jesus. This is his conclusion. I spoke with him. I questioned him. There's no fault in him. He's not criminal. That's my conclusion. I'm the pilot. I'm, I'm the judge of, of this region now. But then he says, and now we have a custom. Should I release unto you one at the Passover. Will you therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? And they all cried again saying, not this man, but Barabbas, the robber. And this is a picture of democracy. People made a choice. What do you want, people? Should I release the innocent man, the king of the Jews? Or should I release the robber, Barabbas? You decide. That's a democracy. You vote. Here's your vote. Make a vote. This is how it looks like when people vote. Because people don't vote for the truth. You know, that's why John says truth. I'm speaking about truth. It's so important. You know what people vote for? For the pleasure for darkness. We can see this in, a, in, a, in a, uh, John 
117 even even further uh, sorry in the John John 319 and this is the condemnation that light is come into the world speaking about Jesus Christ and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil you know people generally they don't want truth they want darkness rather you know light speaking about Christ and and about information light when we turn on the light you get more information you get definition when we bring darkness you see nothing so the light always speaks about the information, about bringing definition. But people don't like this. People don't like truth. You know, truth, oh, it's painful. It's so painful. That's why we are taught to speak truth in love. You know, it cannot be separated. And you will see, as we read here in Second John, verse 1, Two and three, it speaks about the truth, 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 and the verse three is grace and love. It cannot be never truth without grace. John 1 17, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth by Jesus Christ. Christ brings always truth with the grace. There's a grace for believer, there's a grace for us because. The truth is so convincing. If it's truth only, it's a law and it brings death. And we know it. But because there's a grace and a love, we have a future. God loves us and he gives us things we do not deserve. He calls us not based on our faithfulness, but based on his faithfulness. So this is very important that the word of God would stay in schools, in marriages, in families, in the people's hearts. You know, uh, how do I protect my children? How can I protect my children? Well, I can be around them a lot of time, but that's not the ultimate protection. Because there will be times when they are alone, and I cannot have oversight over their actions. How do we protect our children? And how do we protect our wives, the loved ones? Well, by investing in them the truth of the word of God. If my children know the truth, you know, the truth will stay with them and it will keep them. Let's read this again. Uh, second John. The epistle of Second John. It says here, For the truth's sake, verse 2, which dwells in us and shall be with us forever. You know, this is a very interesting character of the truth. When we discover and receive truth, it will stay with us forever. Even though when we deny it, even though when we don't like it, we may say, I don't like it, I don't believe it, no, no, no. And then you go home, it's there. It stays with you forever. Then you go sleep on a pillow and you have it in your heart. You have heard the truth. God loves you. When you, when you walk astray, when children go on the street and you know, you lose sight of them and you don't know what they are doing, you hope that the truth invested in their life will do the protection. I remember days, you know, I did bad things. But always, the truth was speaking to me. I knew it's wrong. I knew. But also, I knew that I am loved by my parents. And I can come home. I knew I am loved by God. The truth is there. Maybe we always don't act based on the truth. But it stays with us forever. This is a great promise. Let's invest truth. 
into our lives personally as we have our own devotion, our own study of the scripture. That's why we do it. Let's invest into others. That's why we are in this. Uh, now back into the verse 1. He says here, Elder, he's speaking about himself, he is writing this letter unto elect lady and her children. Just for quick understanding, some people say it may be some lady, uh, which is unknown, but most likely he's speaking about the church. He just calls her lady and her children. Uh, we can see this correlation also if you skip to the last verse 13, then he says, and from our part, the children of your elect sister greet you. So he's making this beautiful language and he's saying, this church, this elect lady, and our church is your sister. We are brothers and sisters. And our churches are sister churches. We are in the same family. And the children, the believers from this church, greet you. And look at this verse 1, it says here. So he's writing John Elder unto this church and her children, the believers in the church. And he says, whom I love in the truth. And then he adds, and not I only, but also they that have known the truth. This is a very beautiful connection. Let's, let's think about it again. He says, I love this church in truth. And not I only, but also those who have known the truth. You see it? Those who have known the truth love you also. You know how many people say, I don't like truth. Truth brings division. If we have this relativism, you are okay, I'm okay, everybody's okay. No. You know, the truth brings division only if we are not aligned with the truth, if we fight against the truth. That's why there is division. If somebody says this wall is white, and I'll be saying, no, it's green, it's green, it's green. Well, is it fault of the truth? No. It's a fault of my behavior. But if I align with the truth, and I'll say also, oh, it's white, and everybody agrees it's white, look at the union. There is no problem. You know, the truth is not bringing division. And it says here, the truth is bringing love. It says, not I only love you, but also those who have known the truth. By knowing truth, we increase in loving. This is beautiful. Because if we know who we are, if we know who God is, if we know the beauty of the church gathering, of the believers, if we know this truth, you know, the love increases. It's very interesting how he connected the word love and truth together. And uh, then in verse 3, we read, and grace be with you, and mercy, and peace, from God the Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. You know, here we see it. He's connecting, he's starting with the truth, and he brings it into grace and love. We mentioned this, there is never true without love, there is never true truth without grace. And he says here that we love one another. Uh, during evangelism yesterday, uh, we were traveling our car. Uh, this was like miracle of God upon a miracle. We had this like plan to go and evangelize like on Bosnian borders. Our car broke down. We just stopped. I opened the hood and I found this screw broken. The belt came off. 
Well, there was a lady which came out at the same time. And she said, here is a car repair place. It was like 50 meters. We got a car there. And the guy said, well, our shift is almost over. But you are in trouble. We will help you. And they just did it. And they said, like, you have four plus hours free because we have to take everything off just in order to change one screw, which got broken. So we went into the city and we performed evangelism there. It was beautiful. My children were involved. They played a little donkey. Elizabeth played little pregnant Mary with the belly. Beautiful. And at the end, you know, we had these young guys and as we witnessed to them, they prayed with me. I mean, we never know if they truly made a decision for Christ, but I believe it was genuine. And there were these young girls which were watching and came and had a talk with us. It was amazing and full of joy. It's like in this verse, whom I love and those who know the truth love you also. Like people who responded to the truth of the love of God, of the gospel, they loved it. But there was one lady which came and she was very angry. She didn't like what we are doing. She said, this is evil. You know? That's very shocking. Well, I thought if you know the truth, you will love it. That's what the Bible says. That's why people crucified Jesus. Because he was the light which came into the world. But people loved darkness more. Because the light brings exposure of their mistakes. The truth brings exposure of the mistakes. But this is misunderstanding of the truth. The truth is with love and grace. Uh, in the Genesis chapter 3, there is Adam and Eve, and they have sinned. And Adam finds the fault. He, he's naked, so he starts to hide. And God is coming and he hides. And God has to call and says, Adam, where are you? And his, his reply, his response is, I was afraid, therefore I hid myself. But when we understand the beauty of the truth, we don't have to hide. We can say, God, search my heart and find whether there is something wrong in me. We don't have to hide it. We can just open it and say, God, heal me. Take care of my problems, fears, sins. I want to be open. Because the picture is not that the police with the flashing lights woo, 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 are chasing a criminal who is like running and doesn't want to be caught. The picture is different. You are the criminal who is doing the robbery. And when the flashing lights are coming, you are like, finally, you came to deliver me. That's the picture of God because we understand He loves us. He comes to give us freedom from the bondage of this untrue behavior. And what was God's solution? Genesis 3 verse 21. Adam made sin or Adam has sinned. Uh, Eve, his wife, also. They are both in it, involved. But God response is this this is the response of truth what do we do when we see somebody sin do we get angry you know sometimes at the children sometimes at wife no 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 we love our wives we love our children but this is the response and unto adam and also to his wife did the Lord God made coats of skins and clothe them? So here in the Genesis, God has slain the lamb. He killed the lamb. That's the first sacrifice. And he tells them, you have sinned. But the response is, I will kill the lamb. Speaking about me. And then he covers their nakedness that nobody sees it with the skins. When we sin, God says, I'll kill the lamb myself and you are forgiven. This is God's solution for the sin. This is truth. It's very painful, but it's so healing. 
It's so liberating. It's so beautiful. When we believe that Jesus bled for us when he died for us. This is God's solution for sin. I will die and pay for you. That's why truth is so beautiful. Because it deals with the pride and with the sin and with the fear. We don't have to hide anymore. We can just say, thank you God for this truth. Thank you, it produces love. Because hearing about this sacrifice, we are in love with Jesus. He died for me. I am in love with him. Not because he deserves it. Of course he does. But not because I see him worthy and I judge him worthy. No, he is worthy. But showing this truth, it creates the love in me. So this is the beautiful part of the truth. Truth, love and grace. So uh, let's keep it in our hearts and just know these things when we receive, it will stay with us forever. That's why we teach the truth. And we have the truth. The world is not relative. The world is not in agnostic state that you cannot know it. God is willing to be known. And we have the foundation of the truth. The foundation has not been removed. We have it. We know what's the truth. And that's why we can go forward and rejoice in it. Thank you very much. God bless you. Amen.